Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. And over the course of the last couple weeks, few weeks, um, I've been doing stories or using stories as a central part of teachings. A couple of weeks ago we used a story from the uh, time of King Arthur, Sir Gawain, and then last week it was a story from the Kata Upanishads of Nachiketa and his descent to the underworld. Um, and this week I want to take a Buddhist text, which text which we do very rarely here, um, but it's one that encompasses a great story or myth, um, and talk about it and see if there's anything of value in it for you as we kind of listen to it. When you look at the Buddhist texts, um, they are on occasion records of formal teachings that were given by the Buddha and then later written down. But a lot of the other th texts that are written are descriptions of encounters where someone would come and say, I heard you're a Buddha, and he would say yes, and then say, I have a question for you, you know, tell me about death, or tell me about uh, how to live wisely, or tell me about this or that, and he would get in a dialogue, or, or, or he would meet wanderers, or yogis, or teachers, or um, farmers, and get in conversation, and then these would get written down. So there's, there's conversations, there's stories, there's teachings, um, and all of them have one purpose. They have the purpose of reminding those who listen of your own fundamental dignity and nobility and freedom of heart, no matter what the circumstance you live in. Just as a capable physician might cure a patient who's in pain and seriously ill, said the Buddha, so, dear friends, whatever one hears and practices of these teachings of liberation or awakening called the Dharma, be it discourses, explanations, marvelous trainings of the heart, teachings, one's sorrow, pain, grief, despair dissipate and vanish. Just as if there were a beautiful pond with a pleasant shore, its water clear, agreeable, cool, transparent, and a person came by scorched and exhausted by heat, fatigued, parched and thirsty, and would step into the pond, bathe and drink, and all their plight and fatigue and feverishness allayed. So, dear friends, whenever one hears and practices the teachings of the liberation of the heart in all these forms, the fatigue and plight and feverish burning of the heart are soothed and overcome. So that's a pretty good advertisement, I'd say, right? Something like that. The particular text for tonight, or the sutra, is one called the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, and it's the story of the last year of the Buddha's life and his teaching. And if you read it as a text or as history, it's pretty boring. But if you read it as a myth, and it's really part of one of the great myths of humankind, the myth of the Buddha's enlightenment, of leaving the palace and going out in his ascetic practices and encountering Mara under the Bodhi tree and overcoming all the difficulties and getting enlightened and so forth, that's a great human myth that's been told by hundreds of millions of people for thousands of years. If you read it in a mythological way, it actually becomes very uh, alive. Um, and the, it's quite clear that it's meant to be read in a mythological way because it has a lot of mythological terms. It almost starts with once upon a time. And it ends with, this is how it was in the old days. And it has these mythological numbers of some king who had a palace with 84,000 gates and a harem with 84,000 wives. I feel for them, you know, and 
gardens of 84,000 kinds of flowers and so forth, and you realize, okay, we're not in the literal world. And one of the problems in our human predicament at this time is that people tend to literalize myth. And they don't understand that metaphor and myth and poetry and so forth speak to the human imagination in this vast way, but it's not literal. Its point instead is to point, it, it points to an experience um, that's not concrete. So, you know, you read about Jerusalem and there's a whole group of people um, who have a quite fundamentalist view, a literal reading of, of Christian text, where it says if there's a red calf of a certain kind born in Jerusalem and certain other things happen in the city, then Jesus will return, the Messiah will come back, and the world, you know, will be uh, um, saved and so forth. And they're breeding that kind of calf in Texas or wherever and trying to ship it to Jerusalem. This is, I mean, but serious, you know. Whereas Blake, the poet, writes about Jerusalem as a state of mind. It's the holy place within the heart. Or you read the Muslim Islamic, you know, descriptions of heaven and the 70 virgins or whatever. Um, virginity is the mythological language for purity, for innocence that's unsullied, for that um, beginner's mind, that uh, sweetness of seeing the world um, with eyes anew. And to literalize it in that way is to misunderstand. Um, tonight is the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish renewal cycle of New Year. You think, well, why is it in the fall? It's kind of odd, right? Shouldn't it be in the spring or winter? But the reason I believe it is is that it's followed immediately by this other harvest festival, Sukkot. Um, and it's really the culmination of the year. We had this beautiful harvest. We picked the grapes and the fruit of the vine and land and so forth, and we've completed that cycle of the year, and then we start again. But if you read in those texts and you read about Moses and the burning bush, you know, and then you go out to the Sinai or the Galilee or something and you look for some bush that's on fire, you're in trouble. <laughs> but if you read Annie Dillard and she writes nature writer, pilgrim at Tinker Creek, and she said, I spent my whole life looking for one moment to see the tree with the lights in it. Or what Whitman said when he saw the grass with every blade of grass afire. The mouse is miracle enough to stagger sextillions of infidels, is Whitman's line. And you all know it. There's a moment that you see a sunset or walk on Mount Tam or by the ocean or witness the birth of a child or some moment that awakens mystery and you see the luminosity of light, of life itself. And so when we literalize myth, it becomes problematic because then you have to fight over, you know, Jerusalem's mine. No, it's, you know, it's yours. It's, you know, it becomes um, stupid. <laughs> and we're actually wiser than that. You know that. All right, so here we are talking now in the mythological territory. Once upon a time, and there are two themes to this particular text. One is a guidance for practice, how to leave the community of followers of the Buddha as he was ready to die. And the second is the wise relationships of one another in community and living as human beings. And it takes place, the setting, once upon a time, it takes place on Vulture's Peak. You can see the vultures flying in this mountain um, in the middle of the great forest of India with tigers and huge trees now mostly denuded and very poor soils because they've been overtilled in Bihar and part of it is de deforested or desert. But at that time it was full of life in that way. And it speaks to how to have wise relationships. It begins with a, the setting up of the image of a kingdom. And it's the kingdom of justice, or the kingdom of compassion, or the kingdom of respect or righteousness. And here's how it does it. It says, once upon a time, or once when the Blessed One was seated on the Dharma seat at Vulture's Peak in Rajgir, 
the chief minister of King Ajatasattu of Magadha came to ask him a question. And the question was, he said, the king sent him, sent the chief minister and said, go see the blessed one because the Buddhas never lie and tell him I'm thinking of attacking the neighboring kingdom, the Vajians, and taking them over and taking everything they have and ruling it as their king as well and see what he has to say about that. (laughs) So the minister goes and passes on the message and the Buddha listens and then turns to his attendant, Ananda, And says, Ananda, this kingdom that they wish to attack, the Vajians, do they hold regular and frequent assemblies? They do, said Ananda. As long as they hold regular and frequent assemblies, they can be expected to prosper and not decline. Do they meet in harmony and break up in harmony? Do they honor the elders among them? Do they care for the natural environment? Do they protect the vulnerable among them, the children? Do they honor and revere the teachings that they have been given by their sages over the years? And each time Ananda says yes, and then the Buddha says, then they can be expected to prosper and not decline. And the minister bows and takes his leave and says, okay, I guess it's not the right day to attack the Vajians. And then the Buddha turns to the assembled monks and nuns and says, in the same way, as long as the followers of the way come together in harmony, break up in harmony, listen to one another with respect, follow teachings that have been proven to be wise from elders and generations before, as long as they preserve their personal mindfulness, and offer care to one another as companions in the way, so too will this community of teachings and followers prosper and not decline. As long as they practice with modesty or humility and faith and mindfulness and joy, as long as they, in both public and private, show loving kindness to their colleagues in acts of body, speech, and mind, so long will they prosper and not decline. So I have some questions to ask you as we kind of go through this text, um, because it's kind of interesting. Um, As long as a society takes care of its natural environment, as long as it has ways to come together and care for one another respectfully, as long as it tends to those who are vulnerable, the elderly, the, the children, so it will prosper and not decline, which is, you know, there's a little political thing going on in here um, that we might consider, right? Um, But here's my question for you. Why didn't the Buddha just say to the minister, war is a bad idea, people suffer, it's the wrong thing to do, you shouldn't make war? Anybody have any thoughts on that? There's a little, we'll do a little dialogue about some of these things tonight. First thought, anybody? Why didn't he just say, don't make war, it's bad? Yes? So he was giving the man who was asking a reason to think about it in himself rather than just giving him a simple answer. That's beautiful. One more? Yes, by drawing attention to uh, right action right speech, right study, etc., and saying that, yes, this will bring life, abundance, he's also teaching that king to bring life to his kingdom. So by drawing attention to right speech or right action, he's showing what brings abundance to life in a way. Yes? Both of these are, are exactly in the direction that it appears to me which is that it's not enough to just say, this is a bad thing. But the Buddha taught a number of times that the wise look at the causes and not just the effects. Instead of saying war is bad, let's see why there is war. And what would it be to create a society where war doesn't need to happen? So it's really, as, as you say, asking that person, that minister and everyone to reflect what are the conditions that allow us to live together in harmony? 
and not just sort of saying cookie cutter, you shouldn't have you shouldn't have war. So then the story goes on, and the gist of it is his travels, the announcement of his death, the last disciples and last teachings, what to keep in mind over the centuries that follow, the last meal, what happens when he actually dies. And one of the next scenes is that he's seated, um, and you get a sense of the mythological nature of it, he's seated in the landa at Pavarika's um, mango grove under these beautiful trees with his disciples. And Sariputta, who's his second-hand man, his chief disciple in wisdom, looks at him admiringly and says, there could never be a better teacher, a more enlightened one than the blessed one. You know, kind of like that. And the Buddha looks back and says, how do you know? Do you know all the teachers of past eons? Do you know the ones who are yet to come? How could you make a statement like that? Who do you, you know, it's just a little bit inflated to say, okay, I know. And Sariputta, being pretty wise, says, again, he answers with a kind of metaphor. He says, there's a great city with a mighty wall, like a castle, and a single gate, and a wise and skilled gatekeeper who rests at that single gate, and that gate is the reality of the present, is now, which is all we ever have in life is now. And when that gatekeeper tends to the present, to the reality of the present, and sees what's skillful and healthy and what's unskillful and unhealthy, and discovers the possibility of liberation now and now and now, they will be awakened just as you, blessed one, have been awakened, and just as the blessed ones of the past and the future, all the Buddhas, they all rest in the reality of the present. And the Buddha said, "Hmm, pretty good answer, you know, just so, sorry, Puta. The poet Rumi who writes, "Um, What is this fuss we make when we will go one by one through that same gate? So here's this kind of the gate also of birth and death that we all share. So he establishes first the sense of a kingdom of justice where if people honor one another, meet with respect, care for the natural environment, care for the vulnerable. And here again is the same image, which sparks something in the heart. What does it mean to rest in the, at the one gate, at the center of your life, in the eternal present, with care for that which is healthy and wise and that which is unhealthy um, to not follow? So setting up this sense that we can live in this way. And then... Having set up this sense, the Buddha goes on to teach about how, in fact, all who are awakened rest in mindful awareness, or what I was calling loving awareness. This is the abode of the awakened ones, the abode of the Buddhas. And they then get up and they wander and they come to the banks of the Ganges River. And they're at the river and the river is quite high, and there's some boats, and there's someone crossing the river in a great raft made of logs. And the Buddha says, at that point, in the flooded, he said, this raft, what is its value, my friends? Kind of these very simple elementary questions. And they say, to cross over to the Buddha, to cross over. And he says, similarly, the teachings of the Dharma are to cross over from the shore of confusion and fear and contraction and misunderstanding to the shore of liberation of heart. And then he looks up, and this is a very famous moment in these texts, and he said, should one have crossed over in in this fashion, would it then make sense to pick the raft up and carry it around with you on the other side? (laughs) And the followers say, no, you know, they're pretty smart, okay. No, blessed one, no, Buddha, it doesn't make a lot of sense. He said, similarly, all the teachings that have been offered to you, the practices of compassion and forgiveness and mindfulness and the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths and so forth, they are skillful means they are your raft to come to cross from confusion and contraction and fear to freedom. Then should you carry them? No. You should then walk freely without dragging the weight of those teachings and practices, you should make use of them, but not be attached to them in that way. 
So again, it's a kind of metaphorical teaching, but it sure is one that you know is useful for humanity, because otherwise we find something that's good, and then pretty soon we want to hold on to it and convert everybody else, and don't realize that it's the means for us to become free, and in and itself is the vehicle for that. It's not the end of the story. So they wander again further in the great forests. And here the Buddha says, I'll take some time alone and sits under a tree um, in uh, a very uh, famous grove not so far from Vulture's Peak. And as he sits quietly, he has a visit from Mara. Now Mara in Indian mythology is the name for the god who represents destruction, greed, aggression, hatred, cruelty, all the things that we might say as evil in some fashion or bad or, or suffering. And in the great myth of the Buddha's enlightenment, Mara comes and tempts him under the Bodhi tree with desires and his armies of flaming arrows and all these kinds of things, and the Buddha remains unmoved. So Mara comes back to visit. And it turns out Mara comes regularly to visit the Buddha and tries to tempt him again periodically. And the Buddha just looks up generally and says, Oh, is that you, Mara, again? I haven't seen you for a while. And then it says, Mara looks somewhat chagrined and says, Oh, he knows me, he sees me, and he kind of slinks away. <clears throat> Which is a great teaching about the power of attention. Because the unhealthy desires that are addictions, or the unhealthy perseveration of thoughts of anxiety or... Uh, or anger towards somebody that you rerun over and over again. You know those forms of Mara that come to you. When you can see, oh, this is the anxious mind, you know, and this is the um, addictive mind, and this is the, you know, guilty mind, and so forth. When you can name it, it's like, oh, you see me, you see, this is the judging mind. If you believe your judging mind, you're in trouble, because mostly you know who it judges. Moi? says Miss Piggy. Yes, that's right. It's just aimed at you. Thank you for your opinion. That's the judging. The minute you name Mara, it gets a lot easier because you're seeing what's true with mindfulness. So the Mara appears and says to the Buddha, may the Buddha now take his final leave, his final nirvana. And the Buddha says, I see you, Mara. And Mara says, yes, I've come many times and you told me long ago when I said, you've taught enough that you would not take leave of this earth until you had a strong community of monks and nuns and lay followers, until the path of teachings was spread widely, and only then would you leave, well, you have a strong community, and the path is spread wisely, and it's your time. And uh, Mara says that to him, and the Buddha says, you need not worry, I am turning 80 this year, and in not many months I will indeed take my leave. Now, one of the great things about this conversation is, um, I'll ask you, why does Mara come to see the Buddha? I mean, what is this little dance about? Why isn't he just happy ever after without Mara coming to hassle him periodically? Yes? You have to shout it. Some, somebody hear that who can repeat it? Turn the mic over there. Um, okay. She said it could be deathbed regrets. It could be deathbed regrets. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, so that's one possibility. Well, I'm going to try and do it without a mic just to make it quicker because we've got a lot of questions. Anybody else have an idea why Mara is coming in this myth? He likes being around the Buddha. He likes being around the Buddha. <laughs> you know, it's kind of close. Thich Nhat Hanh, Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh. And Sean, I think you could turn on the fan in here, get a little air moving. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, great Zen Master and wonderful teacher, has this a beautiful scene in his writing about Mara coming to visit the Buddha, as he does in these texts periodically. And Ananda, the Buddha's attendant, is there. The Buddha's sitting quietly in a cave. And Mara comes and said, I want to see the Buddha. 
and Ananda, who doesn't like Mar at all, hates him, you know, <laughs> says he's napping, he's resting, it's not a good day, come back another time, tries to get out of him. And then from inside the cave, the Buddha says, Ananda, who has come? Is that my old friend Mara? Would you set out some tea, please? And so they set out a table, and they sit down, and the Buddha pours tea for Mara and says, how's it going? And Mara says, it's really tough being the evil one. He said, people don't like you, you know, they do follow what you suggest, but they don't do it quite the right way, and everybody hates you and so forth, and, you know, it's not all that easy being Mara. And the Buddha says, yeah, it's not all that easy being Buddha either. People don't listen to me either, you know, and they don't follow what I say and so forth. And they take tea and they kind of share their difficulties and so forth. And then, say, okay, see you again. And there's something in this, mythologically, that says the point isn't to get rid of these parts of our human nature, but to understand them. And to understand them from a place of compassion. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian writer, and you know, who lived for a long time in the in Siberia, in the Gulag archipelago, in those terrible prison camps, he said, "If only there were evil people out there insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary simply to separate from the, them from the rest of us and destroy them." But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who among us is willing to destroy a piece of their own heart? And so the story or the myth is saying, if you want to awaken, you have to understand that without Mara, there wouldn't be a Buddha. I mean, the whole story doesn't work unless he's under the Bodhi tree and he's having to solve some problem. And so Buddha and Mara are actually related. And you know where they live. You want their address, right? You know. <laughs> and you start to say, right, this is our predicament as human beings in this incarnation. And we have to learn to deal with the forces of Mara and say, I know you, I see you. doesn't mean we have to follow them, but we have to be conscious of them. And as soon as this happens, then there's an enormous earthquake, terrible hair-raising hair thunder, and this huge earthquake. And Ananda comes running to find the Buddha, and says, there was a great earthquake. Did you feel that? And the Buddha said, yes, of course I did. He says, well, what's, what's going on? And the Buddha said, well, there are eight reasons or eight times that an earthquake happens in the life of a Buddha when the Buddha is conceived and when the Buddha is born, when the Buddha first renounces the palace and when the Buddha um, sits under the Bodhi tree and there are these eight stations or times. Um, and at the last one is at the death of the Buddha, the earth shakes. And then he said there's also the earthquakes of natural causes, which we have in San Francisco. We know this kind of. But again, you know, looking mythologically, why the image of the earthquake? And one of those times that he says the earthquake is when the Buddha recognizes that this is the end of his life, that he renounces and says, okay, only a little bit longer to live. Why the earthquake image? Anybody? Because upheaval promotes change. Because upheaval promotes change. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Way back? Dramatically gets your attention. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> Dramatically gets your attention. And my, my brother is um, in charge of earthquake preparedness for the city of San Francisco. He does all kinds of other things, too. He's the chief building inspector and all kinds of stuff, engineering, architecture. Okay. But... Um, He's, he says, it's not when, um, it's coming, you know, soon. And we really need to understand that this is part of the life that we live, that things get shaken periodically, and we need to prepare ourselves so that we can do this wisely. But earthquakes, exactly what you said, it shakes the foundation. And so the big moments of our life, birth, death, uh, transformation, uh, that come at that time, open up the small sense of self where we're doing our to-do list and getting things done and remind us that we're part of this enormous mystery of incarnation that changes all the time and that at some point is going to end in the earthquake of death for us. It's certain. The only thing that's uncertain is the time. But the fact is that it will. And so it does. It shakes our ground. It gets our attention. And then Ananda begins to weep and beg and say, please don't die, please stay longer. 
Many times you've said you could live a really long time. And then the Buddha turns to Ananda, who's his attendant and beloved in the community and cousin. And he says, it's a very weird thing. He says, it's too late. I've already agreed with Mara and you never asked me to stay. I gave you many hints in the Black Snake Pool and in Jivaka's Mango Grove and in Rajgir in the Deer Park and in the cool wood of Tapoda. I would say if someone were to ask the Blessed One to live for a hundred or more years in such a way that this was genuine, then the Blessed One could indeed do that. And you would nod and say, oh, how wonderful. I gave you these hints and you never asked. And yours is the fault, Ananda. Talk about guilt tripping, right? This is like a maximum guilt trip, right? And he says, and now you have ignored these hints. Yours is the fault. And now this body is like an old cart held together with leather straps and thongs. And it's just able to drag itself around and its time has completed. All right. Now this is a question for you. Why would he, why, why is this in the myth? Why would he say yours is the fault, Ananda? So, so any, any thoughts? Because it's so human to externalize. Because it's so human to, ex to, externalize. to externalize and said it's not just me person. with an intimate person, right? So she's pointing to, you know, marriage and intimate relations, <laughs> where we always, or we, where, where it can be our human nature to blame it on somebody else. <laughs> okay, that's one possibility. I like that. What else? <laughs> You're all laughing because you recognize this. Yes. <laughs> So it's not facing reality in some way, so that's another way of looking at it. A way that I see it is that it's saying that the teacher-student relationship is not a one-way game, that it is a two-way responsibility, and that in the end, you know, we are in relationship to one another. And in fact, later in this very story, um, the, just before he dies, the Buddha praises his attendant and cousin, Ananda, who was known to be the most gracious and caring person in the entire community and knew exactly with sensitivity and timing when to bring people to see the Buddha, when to let the Buddha rest, how to manage all the desires and needs of the people in the community. And his speech was said to be beautiful and his teachings and guiding were lovely. So the Buddha praises him a lot. But in this moment, it's as if it's saying, it's not just me, Ananda, it's us. We have this relationship, and you have to tend and be responsible as I do. We have to, it's a two-way street. At least that's my interpretation of the myth for the moment. Now in each scene, because then they go along and they wander along the banks of the Ganges River, and then the Buddha offers teachings. And the main teachings he offers are the teachings of uh, integrity or virtue, which I'll talk about in a minute, of concentration and, and quieting, stilling, focusing of the mind, and, and then of wisdom. And he offers these teachings repeatedly as he goes from place to place. And at the end of the teachings, he says a really interesting thing. Almost every time after this group that he teaches leaves, he finishes and they, you know, there are these nice things that say, oh, we heard you and it's beautiful and that inspires us and we'll live with more integrity and, and, and more clarity and so forth. All done, nice teaching. And then his last phrase is, now it is time for you to do as you see fit. And he says that each time. Why does he say that? Choice. 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 Thank you. To remind them to, rem it's up to, them. to remind them that it's up to them. And one of the epithets of the Buddha, which is to say he has all these titles, you know, the blessed one or the illuminated one or this and that. One of the titles of the Buddha is called the teacher of those who can be taught, <laughs> which I always find very helpful, salutary, you know. Um, but it's exactly that, that... Um, 
we can love another person, we can support another person, we can be dedicated to the care of a person or a community or place, but in the end we can't love for another person. We can't let go for another person. We can't mature for another person. So here is the best that I have to offer. And then it's an act of empowerment. Now it is time for you to do as you see fit. So the Buddha isn't trying to take on in some um, foolish or unconscious or not the, what's the right word, in an unwise way, something that's impossible between human beings to say, all right, now I'm going to save you because in the end you can save yourself. So it goes on, all right? The teacher can't do it for you. The teacher can barely do it for themselves, but we'll leave that aside. Okay. <laughs> so then they come to the Buddha and it's getting spread around that he's going to die. And the disciples come and they say, let's see, how are we doing with time? I think we can do this. Is this okay? Is this with me still? They say, all right, who will be our guide when you're gone? People start to realize, okay, we've had a really good run here. We've had this amazing teacher who's been with us. Who will we now turn to? And what was interesting is that the Buddha did not place anyone in charge of the community when he died. Instead, he said, the truth will be your guide. The practices that you do, the life that you live. He said, be a lamp unto yourself. Make of yourself a light. Let the teachings of compassion, forgiveness, mindfulness, awareness, freedom, let these be your guide. And you will be guided to your own awakening. And then they said, well, how do we do this? And he said, you begin by contemplating most intimately this breath of your life, this body that you've been given, this mysterious incarnation, by contemplating the river of feelings. You know that river, don't you? Remember I said William O. Douglas, the justice of the Supreme Court, who said at one point, um, at the Supreme Court level where I work, 90% of our decisions are made on an emotional basis. The other 10% is the rationalizations we use to write about them. I mean, feelings do everything for us. They guide us in all these ways. So to learn to become mindful of breath, of body, of feelings, of the stream of thoughts, and let the capacity of awareness, of loving awareness, and attention to what's true be your guide. Become the witness, the one who knows. And then he goes on. He says, then how will you know what are the true teachings of the Buddha? And he says, if someone says, I heard it from the Buddha's lips, or I heard it from this community of elders, or I heard it, I saw it written down, or I heard it from this person, he said, don't believe that, nor disbelieve it, but rather consider it wisely, and only if it conforms to the gist of the teachings that you've heard, to the essence of them, and if it conforms to your own deep understanding, then and only then should you follow it. And so he went from place to place, and he would say, here are the teachings I want you to remember. They're the teachings of integrity, that is to say, non-harming or compassion, that it's very hard to awaken or even to sit quietly after a day of killing and stealing doesn't work very well in your meditation. So if you want to live a life that is free in heart, speak what's true, do not cause harm to yourself or others through stealing, through um, denigrating other life, uh, through killing, through all the things that we know that cause harm. There's a kind of basic list of them. Um, and it's not that there are some moral code written down that you have to follow as a commandment, that's, that's kind of one mythological language for it. But in this case, they are, they are expressed as the trainings of compassion, the awakening of non-harming to yourself and others. 
And this is the ground for freedom, because if you're caught in greed and anger and stealing and lying and so forth, um, you're not going to have a happy life, you're not going to have a free heart. So he said, this is the first ground. And then based on that, find ways to quiet the mind and center yourself. To contemplate through the trainings of mindfulness and loving-kindness and awareness, based on now having an integrity in your life, quiet yourself so you can look deeply. Take time alone, take time to settle and silence yourself. And then with this inner stillness and silence, because we are surrounded by a layer of noise, but beyond that by an ocean of silence, by this vast silence of the galaxies. And when we open to this vast silence, we start to see the mystery, which is where wisdom arises. And we realize that our life, like every life, breathes, and that each day is new, that things really can't be held on to. If you try and hold on, you get rope burned, basically, right? And that every morning at breakfast is a new life. Zen Master Suzuki Roshi called it beginner's mind. He said, when you realize the fact that everything changes and find your composure in it, there you find yourself in nirvana. And there is a f nirvana or freedom or grace or graciousness that's possible for us when we see with wisdom that things are changing and we accept the change and respond to it with compassion and care rather than fear and clinging and holding on. And so there are these fundamental teachings of wisdom. And then they're outlined in uh, very essential and basic ways where, um, again, somebody says, well, how will we know what really matters? And the Buddha again replies in this text. He says, where are we, 253? Um, If you practice the establishment of mindfulness, the, if you develop the Brahma-viharas of compassion, joy, love, and equanimity, if you cultivate the factors of enlightenment, of energy and dedication and truthfulness and clarity and calm, and he goes on, the basic lists, if you see the Four Noble Truths, suffering, its causes, and its end, those are the teachings that will liberate you. Measure what you take to be practice and teachings in this tradition from those essential and fundamental principles. And so he kind of th puts it back in people's hands and says, you know, you understand, it's not that complicated. What's next is that you must do it. You must undertake this. And then he wanders with a large group of followers, but the tra travel gets difficult. He gets sicker. And the story is that the travel's difficult, yet his heart is at peace. And he goes to this large, beautiful forest grove to visit um, uh, because he was invited to come to this beautiful forest grove by the courtesan, Ambapali. And um, he takes rest in this grove, and Ambapali arrives um, with a retinue of followers in the most magnificent carriages, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, whatever, <laughs> right? Dressed in the finest silks and perfumes. I mean, this is the best of that day. Takes their leave from the carriages, takes off their Manolo Blahniks and other fancy <laughs> shoes, right? And goes barefoot to pay their respects to the Blessed One. And the Buddha instructed and roused and inspired and awakened them to the possibility of living with a wise and free heart, living with loving awareness and dignity. And they listened and they were inspired to live in such a way. And then Ambapali invited the Buddha and his company of followers to have a great meal the following morning. They eat once a day, the monastic, and the Buddha accepted. And just at that time, the nearby community of the Lichavis, which was the kingdom near, near where he was staying, heard the Buddha was there, and they got out their finest chariots and their great silks and their banners and all of this, and dressed in 
blue and red and violet and white in silks and adornments and they came in their royal carts with horses and elephants and banners and all kinds of makeup and they said the blessed one is here we are going to see him and they met Ambapali on the road coming out and it wasn't a very pleasant meeting they said where are you coming from Ambapali they said well I've just been seated with the blessed one and he's offered these beautiful teachings they were all really glowing and happy said I'm glad you're going in and um, and I invited him for a great meal tomorrow before he leaves for the next place. And they said, no, we were going to invite him. How dare you, you know? And they went to see the Buddha, the, the Lichavis, and they took their seats around and they listened to all the great teachings. And they said, we please, we want you to come to a meal at our palace. Amazing. We'll make a great feast for, for you all. And the Buddha said, I'm sorry, but I've already... Uh, accepted the meal from Ambapali. And they began to weep and they said, no, that mango woman. That was the sort of slang for how bad she was. And the Lichavis ran after her and said, we'll give you a hundred thousand gold pieces for that meal that we can offer to the Buddha. And she said, no way, not for a kingdom would I give that up. And they went back and begged the Buddha. And he said, my dear friends, she asked first. So why is the courtesan in here, in the story? What do you think? Well, Jesus had one too. Jesus had, <laughs> she says, well, Jesus had one too, so apparently it just fits in these kind of stories. I like that, thank you. <laughs> equality, something about equality, nice. Obviously what? She was a wise woman. Obviously she was a wise woman. I'm a Pali, thank you. She represents that which we would judge. And that's a beautiful answer. Um, who can practice? What are the values of the Dharma and the values of the heart? And it's repeated over and over in these texts in really kind of remarkable ways for 2,600 years ago. Because over and over again, the Buddha says, not by race, not by caste, not by ability, not by creed, not by parenthood. And, you know, and in India, caste was like race in the most kind of racist society. And still can be, you know, the outcasts. Um, you can't eat food if it was, if the shadow of an untouchable past across the food of a Brahmin, they would throw it away, it would pollute it. Imagine that you're, a Bra that you're a, an untouchable child and, and that's what you're taught, that, that, that even casting your shadow on something would poison another person. And the Buddha turned the whole thing radically on its head and said, not by race, no racism, no caste, no creed, no nobility is the is the birthright of every human being and all are welcome into what he called the dispensation of the Dharma or the teachings of the Dharma and made it immensely clear and the community was a community that was enormously diverse um, and so this is a really important part of the teaching that no one is excluded that every human being is worthy um, to awaken and it's quite radical O oh, nobly born remember who you really are so then the Buddha goes on to receive his last meal at Pava's mango forest. And only he takes this particular food that's been given by Kunda the smith. He says, bring the foods, the best hard and soft foods, and it's his last meal. And then he gets, enorm he gets um, very, very sick from this food that's given to him. And he has horrible pains and... His body is racked, and he knows he's clear, near death. And he calls Ananda to talk about the last meal. And he says, perhaps Kunda the smith will have some regrets that he has fed me this last <laughs> meal. <laughs> I would like you to let him know that two of the most important things that one can do in the life of a Buddha as those who care for him, is to give him the meal right before his awakening and to give him the last meal before he dies. So please assure him that it's fine. It's a beautiful thing. Why is this in the story? 
How would this be in this myth? Ultimate forgiveness. It's a teaching of forgiveness. Thank you. It's also the last nourishment. It's the last nourishment in some important way. All of those true. There's something else really important, and that is that the key to karma is intention. And the intention of Kunda the Smith was to make a beautiful meal and offer it. And the Buddha could feel that intention. And this is really what he responded to. Um, because you can take a car and drive it through a fence or a, a hedge into the yard and crash into somebody's living room. Okay, So here's the act. You're in the car. You crash into their house because you're pissed at them. They're a neighbor and they've done something really wrong and you're so angry and you get, just get so steamed up that you drive through their damn fence and crash it down, right? That's a certain karmic act. And it has a certain consequence, right? When the little blue lights come to visit you. Or you can take a car, drive it, crash through the fence or the hedge, crash into the person's house, exactly the same act, by accident. Maybe something happened with the brake pedal or the gas pedal or something else distracted you and it happens by accident. The exact same act, the fence is knocked over, the car crashes into the living room and so forth. Completely different karmic results. Why? Because the intention is entirely different. And so the Buddha is saying, the intention of this man, the genuine deep intention was a good one. And so you should tell him that this is really a, a, a great act that he's done. So he doesn't, it's an act of forgiveness, if you will, as well. And then he sits in the forest glade and a uh, wanderer, Pakusa, comes along, this wandering ascetic. Um, and there's a huge lightning storm and the Buddha's just seated there so quietly and this ascetic says, my God, what a great yogi. It's as if he doesn't even hear the lightning or the rain. And the Buddha said, that's nothing when you live in the realm of the timeless, beyond uh, beyond the physical body when you live in the Dharma body, which is the body of existence itself, not the small self, but loving awareness that is everything, the consciousness, then lightning storm is nothing. And he says it in a way, not in a proud way, but he just says, this is not who I am, this body. Who we are is this mystery of consciousness. And you rent this body, you get it for a little while, but it's not your true nature. You know, I talk about it all the time. You look in the mirror and you see it's older and it's drooping and wrinkled and whatever it does, you know, when it ages a little bit, right? Losing its fur. But you don't feel older when you look. And that's the weird feeling, right? Because it's only your body that's getting old or older. But your mind, the consciousness that knows it, doesn't exist in time. The body exists in time, but the knowing the awareness is timeless. And that's, um, that, who, who was born into your body? This is the, your true nature. So the Buddha points to this, and he rouses Pakusa and inspires him and sets up what has been knocked down and points out the way to one who's been lost and lights a lamp in a dark place so those with eyes can see. All these beautiful metaphors illuminating the path of freedom that there's a liberation beyond this physical body. You can respect this body, but it's not who you are. And Pakusa becomes so inspired that he calls for some friends to come and bring these beautiful golden robes that he offers to the Buddha. And when he does, and the Buddha puts them on, the skin of the Buddha starts to glow golden light pouring out of it sort of the best makeover you can imagine, or something like that. <laughs> Why is the guy glowing gold? Anybody? At this point... <laughs> oh, he, he's racked with pain, he's not dying yet, then he feels a little better, he moves on and he's sitting under a tree. Okay, thank you for asking. He's not, he's not lying there like this. He got up, he got a little bit better, he's taking the old cart. He sits under a tree, there's a huge storm, and then, th thank you, so it's good to clarify, okay. 
So now, you know how these stories go, they move on. And now, now he gets these robes, the last offering of robes, and he starts to glow golden. Why would he glow golden? His presence is, has, been has been enhanced. Thank you. Lovely. Somebody else? He's becoming light. He's becoming... He's dropping his physical body. He's dropping his physical body and becoming light. There's something mythologically really important about gold, and it's not just like moving back to the gold standard and doing away with the Fed or something like that. <laughs> But one of the remarkable things about gold, whether it's the Mayan or Aztec or, you know, African kings in Mali or, you know, Indonesia or whatever, all around the world there are these amazing things that are from antiquity that are gold, is it doesn't tarnish. You know, part of what makes it so beautiful is that you create something out of it and it remains shining. It doesn't lose its beauty and its luminosity and its luster. So gold becomes a symbol, again, we're in the world of symbols, of that which is untarnished, which can't be lost, which is um, outside of the tarnishment of time. And so the Buddha starts to live, as you say, not in his physical body now, but in Dharma body. And then it gets worse, and he has great pains and severe bloody sickness, and he lays down in the lion's pose on his right side between two sal trees, and they burst into bloom. And Ananda is by his side, and he says, Ananda, tell some of the people nearby to move away um, so that all the devas and angels that are here, the angels of purity and kindness and radiance and beauty and so forth, who've gathered to see the last day of the Blessed One, could also have a peek. And the trees are in bloom. And then Ananda complains. We're almost done. I think we'll be done by 9.15. I'll work on this. Ananda complains and says, don't die here. We're out in the country. We're in this tiny little village, Kusinara. He said, this, don't die, actually, the translation, in this, in this miserable daub and wattle village. It's like an anthropological term, if you remember from college. Daub and wattle is basically houses that are made of sticks and mud and cow dung, right? Couldn't you go back to Varanasi, to Benares, or to one of the great cities where the kings will put you in state in the palace? Why die in this daub and wattle village? And the Buddha looks back, and he says, don't call this a miserable backwater, which is what Ananda did, because once upon a time on this very spot, there was a palace of the king Mahasudasana, who was a wheel-turning monarch of the center of the world, and the kingdom was prosperous and well-populated, never free from the sounds of elephants and carriages and gongs and cattle and cymbals. And he was a just ruler, and the gates of 84,000 directions opened from his palace north, south, and east and west, and the roads that streamed out of there were full of those making commerce and making music. And so this is a place where I am happy to die. Now, that's an interesting one. Why does, he, why does this happen in the story? It's a show of impermanence. It's a show of impermanence. Okay, thank you. Someone else who hasn't? Yeah? Go ahead. Say it louder. Beautiful. Wherever we are is really is the place, isn't it? You know, there is no place that's not holy. Um, the still point of the turning world, any place can be the kingdom of justice. When Nelson Mandela walks out of 27 years of Robben Island prison, that prison was the kingdom of justice. You know, when Aung San Suu Kyi comes out of 17 years of house arrest, that little house in Rangoon was the kingdom of justice. In any place where the heart and mind are are clear and pure, compassionate and wise, is the center of the world, is the the kingdom of righteousness. And so it accepts that this is so wherever we are. And then there's one last visitor who comes to see the Buddha. Ananda says, no, he's, he's too sick. And the Buddha says, let him in and gives him this 
teachings and the man becomes inspired and then the Buddha says, does anyone here have doubts? And people are silent. Maybe they don't want to ask at that moment. And he says, I have shown the way. I have shown the way for all who I have met, the way of virtue and integrity, of generosity and compassion, and the inner practices that lead to freedom of heart and mind. I have offered it with, with open hands. Then be of good resolve, all of you. He says, and if you practice rightly, the earth will not be free of awakened beings. And then he looks up in his last words. He says, remember all created things are impermanent. They arise and they pass away just as this body. Become a lamp unto yourself. Make of yourself a light in the midst of change. And he closed his eyes and went into deep meditation and then died. And the Davis rained, angels rained flowers on him. This is mythological, remember. And the earth shook and there was thunder and they placed his body uh, on the finest sandalwood and um, wrapped it in silk and linen and 500 monks circled with their shoulders bare by the, you know, led by the great Mahakasapa. Um, and the fire ignited by itself. Um, and at the same time, perfumes rained down. You know how these things happen. And some, and some there wept and cried out and tore their hair in grief. And then the other enlightened ones started to grumble. I like this. And said, didn't the guy just say everything's impermanent? Aren't you paying attention? Come on, stop weeping and get with the program. Things are just... <laughs> oh. But why do they have the grief? and then the complaining of the enlightened ones. And I guess I'll answer this question, the last one, because we're near the end. And it's related to what we've said all evening, because to be wise means that we have to hold the opposites of the universal and the personal. And in fact, it is ephemeral, ephemeral and you will be gone, and your memory and the things will be seeds that grow in new ways that you won't see. It is a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, an echo, a rainbow, a phantom, a dream. Life goes like that. Completely impersonal, universal. You are part of the dance for a little while in this way, and yet nobody's ever been quite like you. Isn't that wild? In a hundred billion galaxies of a hundred trillion stars, there's not one person in the whole universe quite like you. And you're precious. And so you need to remember your uniqueness and honor it. And when someone dies, there's tears because there's something marvelous about existence. And at the same time, it's also the nature of things. So that when Ramana Maharshi, the great Indian sage, was dying in the 1950s, wonderful old man, that the Dalai Lama said, if I could have met one person when I came out of it, he came out in 1959, the Dalai Lama left Tibet, and Ramana died earlier in the 50s. He said, if I could have gone anywhere in India, it would have been to see this man, Ramana. And people were weeping as Ramana was dying of cancer. And he looked back with this beautiful, it's called the glance of mercy, of just so much love. And he said, but where could I go? Where could I go? It's just this body that's dying, but who I am, this heart that we've shared, that can't ever go anywhere. It's who we are. It's who you are. Where could I go? And so we hold these opposites, the opposite of the opposites of eternity that we are a part of. You are, you are a part of eternity. And the temporal, vulnerable nature of incarnation. And the funeral was held and the Buddha was treated like the remains of a king and all these great, you know, flowers and rain and a stupa was built at the crossroads and the ashes were divided and given to all castes and creeds to take in all directions. And the world honor one was then saluted by those who came in the thousands. And the end of the story is that if we practice rightly, 
which is to say, if we actually practice loving awareness and mindfulness, integrity, if we see with the eyes of wisdom and the heart of compassion, then the earth will not be free of enlightened beings. And if we long for justice and beauty, the kingdom of righteousness and the kingdom of justice can only be found one place, and that is where we are. 